And then I'm also going to close it off with some of the things that I learned. But before I start, I want you all to know I, had, I did have a real big issue or I guess conundrum with whether or not I should share my testimony with you all or not because this isn't about me. And I didn't want to use this time to uh, talk about myself. But as I thought about it more, I started to realize like God is being glorified through the things he does through us. So it is my duty to, respond, or to uh, share with you all my testimony and the things that I learned on the way. But before I get started, will someone here, does anyone want to pray? All right, yeah, you can pray. <laughs> uh, Jesus, I pray for Anders that you need not to get out of the way. Pray I pray it's just a priest of your body. Of course, the word of Pastor Paul that we just heard before, that he was actually praying for Anders. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Awesome. All right, so let's just jump right into it. So my name's Andrew, if you don't know me. I'm a youth leader and a worship leader here. Um, my story starts very similar to a lot of y'all's. I was born into a Christian home. I had Christian parents. I had a brother, two sisters. And I had a love for music. And that was something my parents saw in me very early and something they fed into. And that quickly became my dream, you know. Music was my everything. I poured in all my time for it. And that became like my life. But something very early on in my life happened to me that kind of shifted my mentality and shifted just everything about me very early on, early on in my life. Things got really dark. Things got really empty. I started to feel empty and broken and like something was missing. And I didn't know what it was. So give it time. By the time I got to high school, that looming darkness was huge now because I never addressed those things I never cared to. So I was full on depressed and anxious and suicidal thoughts and just had all these terrible things going on inside of me, which led me to finding an, or wanting to find an answer. And for me, that was women, drugs, sex, and anything that would distract me from that pain. Um, during that time, like I said, music was my life, so I started a band to try to fill that void and that was my dream, you know? I wanted to be a professional drummer, I wanted to be a rock star. That band got signed, we ended up touring, doing some big, big things, awesome things. But my girlfriend at the time ended up getting pregnant, so everything that God gave me, looking back now, knowing that God gave me those things, I squandered them, you know? And I was angry with God, because now I had to leave the band. My dream was right in front of me, and I left it to take care of my new child, and my soon-to-be wife. So when that got taken from me, I got married at 19, and I joined the military. And from there, this resentment in me started to grow towards Peyton, my ex-wife. And I started to blame her for the things that I was going through, and started to hate her, and just grow more and more into my depression, into my anxiety, into my suicidal ideations, and I just hated my life. Eventually, years go by of our marriage, and I end up getting deployed. Things never got addressed. Things never got fixed. I went to Saudi Arabia feeling still extremely lonely now. I was by myself in a war zone by myself, and I was selfish. I was selfishly thinking about what I was going through and didn't care what she was going through because I hated her. I was resentful. So I started talking to other girls, started doing things I shouldn't be doing, talking to people, and going outside of my marriage. And Peyton found out, and she forgave me. And when I asked her why, I still remember, she said three words, or four words, she said, because I love you. And what should have been a turning point in my life to open my eyes to what I was doing, that was the triggering point for me. And that was when I was like, you know what? Like how, like why are you not more angry? So I took it in my own hands and I said, I want a divorce. So I left and I was excited, you know? I was happy about it because now I could live how I wanted. I could do the drugs I wanted without her talking to me about it. I could go to the parties I wanted to, could talk to any girl I wanted to. So now I wasn't angry at her anymore, now I was angry at God. I was in my 20s going through a divorce, I had two kids, no family, no friends out there. And I remember being so angry to the point that I left in the middle of the night one night in Saudi Arabia that I, I went to the volleyball courts which were off by their own outside the tents and I remember just 
falling to my knees and screaming at the top of my lungs and cursing at God, telling him how much I hated him for the life he gave me. And I denounced my faith right there because I got baptized when I was young. I was raised Christian, my parents, and I got baptized at seven, so I, I knew the Lord, but I didn't know, know the Lord, you know? So I denounced my faith right there, and I remember saying, like, if, you, if I know there's a God, and if this is how you are, then I, I don't want anything to do with you. And I told him that. And I had, I had this huge wave of actual excitement. I was excited to be able to live for the world again. Because now I didn't have this conviction or this sin or the acknowledgement of sin. I was excited to, to, to dwell in my sin, you know. So several months go by of me living this life, just partying, doing drugs, drinking, talking to all these girls, doing whatever I wanted to. And then I get a DM from Peyton's best friend's sister, who also hated Peyton and wanted to get back at her. So she had a plan to get back at her. And that was for me and her to get together and to make her jealous, basically. So we end up dating, and I remember telling myself, like, this is going to be the moment where I give my all to this relationship, and this one's not going to fail. And then, so I gave up everything again. I left the military. We moved in together. And very soon after that, the abuse started. There was emotional abuse, mental abuse, and eventually it got physical, where she began hitting me. And I remember first time it happened was on Thanksgiving Day, and I went to my parents' house for Thanksgiving, and I had a handprint on my cheek. And my brother saw that, and he said, you know what, let's get you out of there. You come live with me. So I did that. But then I got there, and I felt even lonelier now. I didn't have a partner. My marriage was falling apart. I had no place to live. I, I felt like a loser, you know? So I went back to her, back to the person who was abusing me, and I thought it was my fault. So give it a couple of weeks, it happened again. But this time I was done for good. I told her after saying a lot of hateful things to her that, that I wasn't coming back. And I said a lot of terribly evil things to her. And it obviously made her upset because soon after that she went to the police and filed a report on me, a false report saying that I was doing things that I didn't do. And I ended up getting arrested and getting thrown in jail. And I was in there for three total days and while this is absolute rock bottom, you know, I have literally nothing now. I can't even see my kids. And I remember the first day being in there, just like filled with stories from things I've heard from my childhood, you know, prodigal son, the, the story of the 99 lambs and all those things. And I didn't know why. Like I, they were just filling my head in that jail cell. And nothing, nothing happened that first night. But then the second night I was in there, I remember just looking around the walls. There's nothing to do in jail, y'all, so it's not fun. So I was staring at the walls, kind of counting the blocks, and I, I remember a carving in the wall that said, pray, Jesus saves. So I remember seeing that and thinking, that's crazy. That, how crazy is that, you know? So I called my mom, and I remember calling her and telling her what I saw on the wall. And she prayed over me, and we just kind of talked for a while. And right then and there, when everything was taken away from me, when I had absolutely nothing, I found joy for the first time in my life because I gave my life to Jesus. So when everything was taken away from me, I still had joy, which I never had my entire life. You know, I tried to fill it up with all these things that were hurting me. And when I finally gave my life to Jesus, everything, it was literally like a, a curtain fell, fell down and I saw the light. I remember making a promise to myself that whether I stay in here or not, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. That I'm going to stick with you. And if I'm staying in here, I'm going to, I'll be a prison pastor. I don't know. I'll preach the word to these people. But I, I didn't know what was coming for me. But I knew that I was going to follow Jesus. So, the worst part of my life ended up being like the highlight of my life. I found what I was missing, and that was Jesus the whole time. And that's my testimony, for the most part. Once I got... <laughs> so then on that third day, I, uh, I end up getting released from prison or from jail. And I remember the promise I made, so I began digging into my Bible, praying constantly. I ended up finding Cornerstone, and I ended up being involved here and being intentional with my walk with Christ. 
And what I learned was as I was going through this and learning more about him, these scars and these things that defined me for so long, they were gone, you know, they were getting healed. It took a lot of time, but I was getting healed. So the first point I, I, that was put on my heart was trust God over feelings. Trust God over your feelings. And I'm gonna read from Jeremiah right now. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I can tell y'all from personal experience, that is 100% correct. I always was half, half in, half out, thinking that that was what I was doing, or what I was doing was correct. That this was, I was a Christian. And it wasn't until everything was taken from me where I realized I wasn't saved and I wasn't living correctly. So trust God over your feelings. He has a plan for you, just like Jeremiah says. Surrender to him. Surrender to that plan. And if, if nothing else, it takes the pressure off because now you know the life in front of you. You know the path set before you. And you have the tool book right there, and that's called the Bible. It's the Holy Spirit. And he is with y'all. You call on him and you will find him. It'll clear, the, it'll clear your foggy mind. There's no more confusion anymore about my salvation. There's no more confusion anymore about how I feel or who I am, because I know who I am now. I know who I am in Christ, and I have the Bible to guide me and reassure me. And the second thing I learned was to guard your heart more than absolutely anything. I'm gonna read from Romans now. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So with that, I called y'all to run away from temptation. Literally get up and run. If you're in a situation you know you shouldn't be, just leave. It is really that simple. Run away from those things. Uninstall those apps. Delete those music. Delete the things that are interfering with your relationship with Christ because they are hurting you. Just get up and leave them behind. The enemy will use these things. He'll use anything to distract you and take your focus off of Jesus. It could be depression, anxiety, lust, jealousy, hatred, anger, sadness. All of these things are distractions and attacks from the enemy. And like that scripture says, with Jesus on our side, who can stand against us? We are conquerors. We can fight back against these attacks, y'all. You are equipped through Jesus. You are strong enough through Jesus. The third point I learned was that feelings change and that God does not. John 1, 1 through 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then in Malachi 3.6, it says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. It says right there in Malachi that God doesn't change. So who is God? If he's never changing, who is he? What is he? The Bible says he's the creator, the redeemer, the alpha and the omega. He's our savior. He is righteous. He is good mighty, alive, he is hope, and he is love. 
Because of those things, John says we are sanctified. Psalm says we are wonderfully made. First Peter says we are gifted as a faithful steward. Second Corinthians says we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Hebrews says we are not forsaken. Galatians says we are free. John says we are loved. And first Peter says we are redeemed. And Romans says we are no longer a slave to sin. And I say all of this and share my testimony with y'all because I, it took me a long time, even after finding Jesus, to accept the fact that I was forgiven and that I was truly set free from these things. And like I said earlier about the, the prodigal son, you know, that was in my head for a while and I ended up relating to that a lot, you know. The father having two sons and the son asking his dad for his inheritance, getting it all and wasting it all, ending up being at the rock bottom basically where he had nothing and he was working for a pig farmer and he was, at so, he was down so bad that he was begging to be fed with the pigs and the Bible says nobody gave him anything. So then he has the idea, you know, my, my, my dad's slaves get fed better than this. My dad's slaves are treated better than this. Why don't I just go back to my dad and be a slave? And then scripture says this about it. Luke 15, 17 through 24. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the, father, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. We're the prodigal children, y'all. You can run as far as you want. The second you turn around, he's waiting for you. He's there with open arms and he's ready for you. And it's not gonna be a thing where, you, I mean, take my life for example. I had conviction and I looked at the things that I was doing and I felt terrible about them, but it wasn't shameful. It was, it was realization of my sin. It wasn't that I was ashamed of them. I wish I didn't do them, but I wasn't ashamed. and it, I wasn't met with a heavy hand. God immediately showed me love when I reached for him. It was immediately refreshing and fell over me. So turn back. Even if you're in the middle of it, he's waiting for you. Turn and run away from the things you know that are keeping you from your walk with Jesus. And even on the day that Jesus was crucified, there were two other people that were being executed with him. Both of them were criminals. Both of them deserved their punishment. Both of them deserved crucifixion, and both of them had what was coming to them. But one of them was saved. That day, right before his death, he was saved. The Bible says this about it in Luke 30, or 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And I think that's absolutely beautiful, y'all. Because we're not the heroes of the Bible. We are the men on that cross. And that is the perfect illustration of it. It's black or white. It's death or life. You repent or you perish. We are all deserving of the cross, but Jesus bore that for us. We are all sinful, wicked creatures, and it is only by God's grace and his mercy that we are set free. And I know it's hard to release trauma and hurt, confusion, control, your worry, because like I said earlier, when I was younger, something happened to me that shifted my whole mentality. When I was about seven or eight, I was sexually abused multiple times by a family friend of mine. And that was something that tainted my vision of love, of life, 
of meaning and it took everything from me. I was so embarrassed and I can still remember my mom's scream, you know, when she found me and saved me from that. It's hard and I was embarrassed and I shoved it away. I tried to pretend like it never happened. And there's a popular saying saying that hurt hearts will bleed on those that never hurt you. And what I realized about my life was I was bleeding on everybody, on my friends, my family, my coworkers, my acquaintances. But worst of all, I was, I was bleeding on my relationship with Jesus. That void that I should have given to the Lord, I filled it up with the world. I filled it up with drugs and sex and girls and anything, absolutely anything. I was always the guy that would try anything because I was that broken. And this was only a year ago for me, y'all. This whole thing happened a year ago. It took a lot of time for me, a lot of intentionality with the Lord to address these things and to finally be healed from them. But he did set me free and he did heal me when I gave it to him. And I know it's hard, y'all, but you can do it. With Jesus on our side, we are conquerors. With Jesus on our side, there is nothing this world can throw at us that we can't take. If you give it to the Lord and follow him, follow in his plan, he is there for you. If you seek him, you will find him. So Josh, if you wanna come up, I'm about to close. <clears throat> I wanna challenge y'all to put your bodies to death and take up your cross and follow Jesus daily, every single day. You know, anytime you feel like doing something, you know you shouldn't, and I know y'all have that enough, the discernment, you know, to know what you're doing is wrong or right. Run away from those things. Because sure, those things feel good. They bring you a brief excitement, but they're not gonna fill you up. Look at my life. I dove fully, completely in it, and I never found the answer. Not once, you can, I've done it all. And I never found the answer until I lost it all and gave my life to Jesus and found him. Because Jesus is the answer. And as I looked back on my life while preparing this message, now I can see Jesus every step in it. You know, I look back at my pain and my hurt and all my trauma, but that had no comparison. There was no amount of pain that compared to the joy that I found in Jesus when I found him. It had no comparison to the love that was waiting for me, and it had no comparison to what Jesus endured for all of us. I'm not a great guy, I'm not, even, I'm not a righteous man, I'm not a role model, and I'm, I'll never be perfect. I'm not deserving. I used to make fun of Christians and think they were silly. But you know what, God plucked me from that and he saved me. And when I finally turned around, he was there with open arms, y'all. And he's there for all of y'all too. So now I look back on my pain and my testimony and I am so thankful for all of it. All of it. Because it's a reflection of what Jesus can transform, what he can heal you from, and what he can deliver you from. So like the man on the cross and like the prodigal son, if you haven't yet, I encourage you to turn and acknowledge that Jesus is our king and he is our savior. So turn and follow him. It's not too late. And if any of y'all are looking for the right moment, right now is always the right moment. Right now is the right moment, always, to turn and repent and to follow Jesus. So I just want to challenge y'all to repent of the things you know you shouldn't be doing and to turn from them and to run from them. Give to the Lord and run from them. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you for this evening, Father God. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you, to praise you, to learn about you, and to worship you, Father. I thank you for these kids, for even just being here, Lord, just taking that step. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people. Lord, I thank you for you and for your son and the healing that you've given us for the sacrifice you've given us through Jesus, Father God, you have made us whole. And I just thank you, God. I just thank you for saving me, 
for giving me an opportunity to preach your word, Father God. We just thank you so much for this evening. We love you and we praise you. It's in your heavenly name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.